Hello. How is everyone tonight? Oh, some people are starting to pop on. Hello, guys. Hello. <clears throat> on this rainy, yucky Wednesday. It's been kind of blech. Hi, everyone. We're going to continue with our third night of reading Judy Bloom's Super Fudge. So, night three. We're going to try to get through three chapters tonight. If we can. If my voice will let me. Because this book has a total, I think, of 12 chapters. So, there's a couple nights, I think, tonight and tomorrow night that we'll have to do three chapters. So, we're going to try to do, oh, chapters five, six, and seven. And then eight, nine, and ten tomorrow night. And eleven and twelve Friday night. So, hopefully, <coughs> excuse me, my voice will let me get through three chapters in one sitting. All right, guys. We'll give it just another minute or two to see if anyone else pops on. Hello. Yeah, it's, the weather is very dreary here today. Rainy and yucky. And I don't, I don't think it's going to be much better tomorrow, unfortunately. But this weekend looks like it might be nice. Well, nicer, I guess. <laughs> All right. Okay, guys. Well, it is, let's see here. We've been on here for it's almost five after, so I think we will go ahead and get started. All right? So, here we go. Chapter five. Oh, and again, third night of reading Judy Bloom's Super Fudge. And this is read with permission from um, Yearling Books, and they are part of Random House. We want to thank them very much for letting us read the book. So, here we go. <clears throat> Chapter 5, Small Ones Are Sweeter. Our house, that is, Millie and George's house, is so old that the bathtub stands off the floor on legs. And the hot and cold water don't come out of the same faucet. So when you're washing your hands, you either freeze them or burn them. Mom says you're supposed to put the plug in the sink and mix the water in the basin. But that's a lot of trouble. At least we don't have chamber pots. The toilet's actually flush. Outside, the house is painted yellow and the shutters are white. The windows and doorways are slightly crooked. Dad says that's part of the charm of the house. I know better than to tell him what I think. Inside, the floors are wooden and they creak when you walk across them. Downstairs, there is a living room with a piano and a dining room and a table so big you have to shout to make yourself heard. A kitchen with pots and pans hanging all over the place, and a library where the walls are lined with books arranged according to color. There's a brown leather section, <clears throat> excuse me, a green leather section, a red leather section, and a tan leather section. Upstairs, there are four bedrooms all in a row. And everywhere you look, there are fireplaces. There's one in every bedroom, there's one in the living room, another in the dining room, and still another in the library. There aren't any in the bathrooms or the kitchen. My mother and father call the house fantastic, fabulous, unbelievable. I hear them talk to their friends on the phone, and those are the dumb words they use to describe this place. Our neighborhood is a lot like our house, old. Every house on the block is a lot like this one, with a small front yard and a big backyard. In our backyard, we have George's Rose Garden and Millie's Herb and Vegetable Garden. The first day we were here, Dad bought a stack of books with titles like Know Your Roses, Know Your Herbs, Organic Vegetables in You, and my favorite, The Agony of Beetles in Your Garden. You didn't have to worry about beetles in New York, did you, Dad? I said at dinner. That's enough, Peter, Dad said to me. 
<clears throat> That's enough, Pita, Fudge repeated. Cut that out, I told him. Cut that out, he said back to me. Fudge's new game is repeating everything I say. He's really driving me crazy this time. Pass the salt, please, I said to Mom. Pass the salt, please, he said laughing. I pushed back my chair. I can't take it anymore. I mean it. Do something, will you? I begged my parents. But he was already at it. I can't take it anymore. Do something, will you? And he laughed so hard he choked. I don't know. Oh, sorry, I lost my place. Dad turned him upside down and whacked him on the back. I want you to stop doing that, Fudge, he said. Do you understand? I don't know what my parents are always asking him if he understands. He understands just fine. That has nothing to do with it. Fudge nodded. Because if you don't stop repeating everything that Peter says, I'm going to do more than just whack your back. Get it? I couldn't help smiling. Mom has this thing that she has called a snuggly for carrying Tootsie. She hangs it around her neck and Tootsie fits right into it and rides right next to Mom's middle. It looks very comfortable. Sometimes Dad carries Tootsie in it too. Mom says they didn't have them when I was a baby. I missed out on a lot of good things. Every night after supper, we walk into town, stopping at Baskin Robbins for ice cream. One night, Mom asked me if I would like to hear if I would like the sling and to carry Tootsie. No thanks, I said. I wouldn't be caught dead wearing a baby around my neck. Oh, Peter, you're so silly. Baskin Robbins is having a contest. They're looking for names for a new ice cream flavor. So far, I've suggested Lemon Lunatic, Crazy Chocolate, and Miserable Mint. After almost two weeks of hanging around the house, I actually met a kid my age. He lives across the street, but he was at scout camp when we first moved here. His name is Alex Santo, and he's going into sixth grade too. He's very small, with hair that hangs into his eyes, and he's always wearing a t-shirt that says, Princeton, class of 91. By the time I met him, I was so lonely and bored, I wouldn't have cared if he had had three heads as long as he was my age and wanted to be friends. Alex came over one morning and said, do you want to go into business with me? What kind of business? I asked. Worms, he told me. Worms? I asked. Yeah, worms, he said again. Worms, Fudge said, jumping up and down on the steps. Wormy, wormy, worms. Alex looked over at him. Don't mind him, I said. He's just my little brother. Oh, Alex said. So, what do you say? Sure, I told him. Having no idea what kind of business, what kind of worm business Alex was talking about. When do I start? How about now, Alex said. Okay, what do I do? First, we dig them up. Then we sell them to Mrs. Mulder down the street. She pays five cents a worm. What does she do with them, I asked. She doesn't say. Some people think she uses them to go fishing. Other people think she uses them in her garden. Personally, he stopped and scratched his head. Go on, go on. I think she eats them, Alex said. I thought for a minute. Worm pie? Yeah, and worm stew, and worm juice, and worm soup, I said, getting warmed up, and worm bread. Oh yeah, that's the best, Alex said. Nice soft bread with little worms here and there. You can make a really tasty worm and cheese sandwich on it, I said. We were doubled over now, laughing our heads off. And worm ice cream, Fudge said, jumping on top of us. Worm ice cream, Alex and I said together. I decided that with Alex Santo, Santo in my class, Princeton might not be too bad. That afternoon, Alex and I went digging for worms. We rode our bikes over to the lake. It's easy to ride in Princeton because they have bike paths on every street. Alex had a pail and a couple of shovels, and we got to work. Finding worms was no problem. An hour later, we rode back to my house. Mrs. Muldoor likes her worms clean, Alex told me, turning on our hose. That figures if she uses them for cooking, I said. We left the pail of worms outside and went in for a drink. When we came out, Fudge was standing next to Tootsie's carriage, dangling a worm in front of her. Cut that out, I yelled, racing over to him. Why? She likes it, Fudge said. Watch. Alex and I looked into Tootsie's, Tootsie's carriage. She laughed every time Fudge held up a worm. 
You're right, I said. She does like it. Hey, Mom, look at this. What is it? Mom called from where she was, weeding Millie's organically grown vegetables. You've got to see for yourself, I called back. She came over, wiping her hands on her jeans. Watch, Mommy, Fudge said, and he took the worm from behind his back and dangled it over Tootsie's carriage. She smiled and gurgled, but Mom screamed. Get that thing out of here! Hurry up! Get rid of it now! It's just a worm, Mommy. Don't you like worms? No, I don't. I really don't like worms at all, and I never want you to show me another one. Do you understand? Fudge put the worm on his arm and let it crawl up his shoulder. See, isn't he cute? I'm going to call him Willie, Willie Worm, and he'll be my very own pet. I'm going to sleep with him, and he can eat next to me at the table, and he'll take a bath with me. Fudge! Yes, Mommy? I told you I don't ever want to see that worm again, and you may not bring him into the house, and you may not hold him close to Tootsie. Do you understand me this time? You really don't like worms? Fudge said. That's right, Mom said. I really don't. Why not? Fudge asked. It's nothing I can explain. Mom went back to weeding the garden. Fudge followed her. Is your family always like this? Alex asked. You haven't seen anything yet, I told him. On our way to Mrs. Muldoor's house, I thought I remembered reading that worms regenerate when you cut them in half, but I wasn't sure. So I asked Alex if he'd ever tried that. Sure, Alex said, plenty of times. And what happens? Nothing. You get two little worms. Right. And if Mrs. Mulder pays you five cents a worm, a slow smile spread across, across Alex's face. I see what you mean, he said. How come I never thought of that? I didn't answer. We dumped our worms out on the sidewalk and cut all but one in half. That one was big enough to cut into thirds. So now, instead of 16 worms, we had 33. Mrs. Muldeur lived in an old house that was painted gray with blue shutters. Alex rang the bell. A big round woman with hair the color of her house and glasses halfway down her nose came to the door. She wore sneakers and blue jeans and a red and white shirt. Well, hello, Alex. Long time no see. Hi, Mrs. Mulder, asked Alex, or Alex said. I've got a partner now. She looked at me over the rims of her glasses. I'm Peter Hatcher. She just moved, I, we just moved in down the street. She kept looking at me, so I kept talking. In the Wentman's house, you know, Millie and George Wentman, they're friends of my mother and father. We're just here for a year to see how we like being away from the city. Are you finished? She asked. Yes. Good. Then let's get down to business. We've got 33 for you today, Mrs. Mulder, Alex said. Real beauties. 33? She held up the jar and studied them. They look awfully small. She gave me a strange look this time, so I quickly added, they'll get bigger later in the summer. Really? I should think they'd be at their best now. Oh, no, I told her. They'll be getting fatter and longer by August, and by September, they'll be in their prime. Is that a fact? She asked. Uh-huh, I said, and I prayed that she wouldn't guess. I didn't know what I was talking about. Well, live and learn, Mrs. Mulder said. She went inside and came back with her wallet. You know, she told us, I could go down to the filling station and buy a container of worms, but I think freshly dug ones are so much better. She opened her wallet. Let's see. Five cents times 33 worms. That's a dollar and 50 cents. She handed the money to Alex. Excuse me, Mrs. Mulder, Alex said, but it's 165. <laughs> Mrs. Mulder laughed. Can't fool you, Al can't fool you, can I, Alex? No, Mrs. Mulder, not when it comes to math. Would you like more worms next week? Of course, as many as you can bring me. You can't have too many worms, you know. Alex gave me a look, and we thanked Mrs. Mulder and walked away. Once we were out of earshot, Alex said, Small ones are sweeter. And he gave me an elbow in the ribs. Worm soup tonight, I told him, and we exploded laughing. After supper, Mom got Tootsie into her sling, and the five of us went off to Baskin Robbins. When we got there, Fudge walked up to the girl behind the counter and said, Worm ice cream. Beg pardon? The girl said. Worm ice cream, he repeated. We don't have the flavor of the month, Fudge told her. Worm ice cream. Are you saying, she began, 
Yes, he is, I said. Worm. That's W-O-R-M. I can spell, the girl said annoyed, but I really don't think that people would go for that flavor. Some people would, right, Peta? Sure, I said. Some people right in this town might think it's terrific. Look, kids, we're very busy tonight, so cut out the wise guy stuff and tell me what you want. I'll have a chocolate chip mint sundae with the works, I told her. And I'll have a fudge ripple cone, Fudge said, just like my name. Oh, your name is Cone? She asked. No. Ripple? No. I suppose you're going to tell me it's Fudge, right? That's right, Fudge said, chinning himself on the counter. Cute kid, she mumbled to herself. Real cute. Chapter 6. Farley Drexel meets Ratface. In August, Turtle needed his yearly checkup and shots. Mom and Dad asked around and decided that the Ark and Animal Hospital near the decided on the Ark and Animal Hospital near the highway. To get there, we drove through town and on, on a bridge over the lake where Alex and I dug worms up a long hill and all the way back to the traffic circle. It seemed to me that they could have found some place closer. Turtle always shakes when he goes to the vets. I don't know how he knows he's going to get his shots, but he does. I tried talking to him softly, telling him it would only hurt for a second, but he whined and cowered in the corner anyway. On the way back, we stopped off at Sandy's Bakery near the traffic circle. They make the best brownies I've ever tasted, and without nuts. Mom is allergic to nuts, which means she can't even eat peanut butter. Without peanut butter, I might starve. The week before school started, I had a lot of trouble falling asleep. It, it was just too quiet in Princeton. I missed the sounds of the city. I tried not to think of my Kreskin's, Kreskin's crystal sitting in its box on the shelf of my closet. I tried counting sheep and reciting the alphabet backwards instead. But when it didn't work, I just couldn't help myself. I jumped out of bed and got it. I held it up. I imagined Kreskin himself standing at the foot of my bed chanting, sleep, sleep. I woke up the next morning with my Kreskin's Crisco under me. I had a pain in my butt from sleeping on top of it, and I felt guilty about having used it at all. I'd cheated on Jimmy Fargo. We'd made a deal, and I'd broken it. Some friend I was. I wanted to tell him that it was okay with me if he decided to use our rock, but Jimmy was in Vermont with his mother, and they had no phone up there. <clears throat> and I wasn't the only one who was having trouble sleeping. I can't sleep anymore, Fudge said at breakfast. Why not? Dad asked. I'm afraid. Of what? Dad said. Monsters. There are no monsters, Dad told him. How do you know? Because I do, Dad said, spreading strawberry jam on his toast. Did you learn it at college? Fudge asked, making mush out of a cereal. No. Then where did you learn it? Fudge asked. Dad sipped his coffee. Then he said, I, uh... I learned it in high school. Come on, Dad, I said laughing. Dad gave me a look to let me know I should keep quiet. I wondered if he and Mom ever told me ridiculous things when I was a little kid, and if I believed them. I'm still afraid, Fudge said. I want to sleep in Peter's room. No way, I said. There is no way I'm going to have him in my room. He talks in his sleep. Then I'll sleep with Mommy, Fudge announced. My mother, who had been reading the morning paper, looked up. What? she said. From now on, I'm sleeping with you, Fudge said. You have your own room, Fudgy, Mom told him, with your own big boy bed. I don't want my own room, he shouted. I want to share. Sharing is better. You always say so. Mom sighed. That's different, she said. Sharing is for toys and cookies and maybe if Turtle sleeps with Fudge, Dad began, but I didn't wait for him to finish. Hey, wait a minute. Turtle is my dog, remember? But you're willing to share him, aren't you, Peter? Dad asked. Not at night. He sleeps with me. Fudge started to cry. Nobody cares about Fudgy. Nobody cares if the monsters eat him up. Nobody's going to eat you up, Mom said. How do you know? Fudge asked. Because I do, that's how, Mom said. Did you learn it in high school? Uh, excuse me? I said, uh, excuse me, I said, getting up from the table, but this is where I came in. F 
Budge solved his problem by himself. Every night, after the rest of the family had gone to sleep, Budge dragged his Snoopy sleeping bag down the hall and parked himself in front of Mom and Dad's bedroom, where he slept. And Mom and Dad didn't do a thing about it. They just get up in the morning and step right over him. They told each other it was just a phase, and he'd get over it. If Fudge wasn't going through one phase, he was going through another. I couldn't help thinking that one of these days, Tootsie would be going through phases too. The way it looked now, there might be no end. On the day before school started, Alex and I rode our bikes to the shopping center to buy our school supplies. That reminded me of Jimmy Fargo and how we always used to go shopping for school supplies together. I felt really lonely thinking about Jimmy and scared about what school would be like here. Maybe all the kids would hate me. Maybe I'd hate them. Maybe we'd hate each other. Maybe I'd get a dumb teacher. Dumb teachers are the worst. I would know. I had one in third grade. That night, I didn't even try to get to sleep without my Criskin's crystal. Even so, I woke up about a million times during the night. The next morning, I asked Mom how she expected me to walk Fudge to school and still ride my bike with Alex. Because Alex told me that all the kids in Princeton ride their bikes to school. Maybe you could ride slowly and Fudge could walk behind you or beside you, said Mom. Come on, Mom. Well, maybe you could walk him until he knows the way by himself. That might take all year, I said. Besides, I want to go to school with Alex. Look, Peter, how about if you just walk him the first week and then we'll see what happens? I don't think you understand, Mom. Sixth graders don't walk kindergarten babies to school at all. And I don't think you understand how disappointed Fudgy is going to be, Mom said, slamming the refrigerator door. But if that's the way you feel about it, I'll take him myself. Good idea, I told her. But Fudge, who'd been listening behind the kitchen door, shouted, No! I want to go to school with Peta. You promised, he told Mom. You promised. Mom looked at me as if to say, You see? Oh, all right, I said. I'll ride and you can follow me. I'll ride too. You don't have a bike. I have a toddle bike. You can't ride a toddle bike to school. Why not? Because you can't. Now hurry up. I don't want to be late for the first day. Alex was waiting for me outside. We headed for school. Fudge tried hard to keep up with us, running alongside our bikes, panting all the way. We were really going slow, but still, he couldn't make it. I felt sorry for the kid. It wasn't his fault that he was just a kindergarten baby. So I scooped him up and set him on the crossbar of my bicycle, even though my parents had warned me a million times never to do that. I think they once knew someone who had smashed his head open that way. But what they don't know won't hurt them. Besides, school wasn't that far. And Fudge really liked riding on my bars. He waved to everybody on the street. I'm starting kindergarten today, he sang. Alex, who had no brothers or sisters, laughed. When we got to school, I took Fudge to Mrs. Hildebrandt's kindergarten and handed her Fudge's registration card. Then I went upstairs with Alex and Mr. to Mr. Bogner's sixth grade. All the kids were singing. <clears throat> who owns the school? Who owns the school? Oh, who owns the school? The people say. Oh, we own the school. Oh, we own the school. Cause we are sixth graders today. I sit down at the desk next to Alex. Oh, on my other side was a girl about three heads taller than me. She had long, tangled brown hair. Mr. Bogner wasn't dumb. I could tell right off. I can always tell. First, he told us about his summer. He was an outward bound instructor in Colorado. He taught college kids to climb mountains. Then we told him what we did over the summer. I would have liked mine to sound more exciting. I would have liked to tell the class, this summer, I sailed the Atlantic with just my dog, Turtle, and my friend, Jimmy Fargo. Oh, sure, we had rough times, but we made it across. Except that Alex was sitting right there, and he knew the truth. There were three new kids in our class. I was the only one from New York. Another boy, Harvey, was from Pennsylvania, and a girl, Martha, was from Minnesota. Mr. Bogner told us about some projects we'd be working on during the year like building a Viking ship and studying our home state of New Jersey. I wanted to tell him that it wasn't my home state and it never would be. But before I had a chance, Martha said, excuse me, Mr. Bogner, but my home state is Minnesota. So will I be studying that? 
while the rest of the class does New Jersey? No, Martha, Mr. Bogner said. As long as you're living here, you can consider New Jersey your home state. But, Mr. Bogner, Martha said, why don't you see me about it after class, Mr. Bogner said. And he didn't sound angry or anything. Later, I found out the girl who was sitting next to me, the tall one with the tangled hair, is named Joanne McFadden. I was going to ask her where she lived when a message came over the intercom. Good morning, Mr. Bogner. Would you please send Peter Hatcher to Mr. Green's office, please? Right away, Mr. Bogner answered. Thank you. Mr. Green was the principal. What did he want with me? Joanne McFadden whispered. What did you do? I don't know, I said, feeling my face turn red. Do you know where Mr. Green's office is? Mr. Bogner asked. I'll find it, I said. Don't look so worried, Peter, Mr. Bogner said. You can't be in that much trouble. It's only the first day of school. The whole class laughed, except Joanne McFadden. She just gave me kind of a shy smile. It probably has something to do with registration, I thought on my way to the office. I bet my mother didn't fill out the part of the registration card about who to call in case of an emergency if the parents can't be reached. She forgets that almost every year. Or maybe the principal likes to introduce himself personally to all the new students. But then, why wouldn't he have asked Harvey too? And Martha from Minnesota? Because he calls, because he calls them into his office in alphabetical order, I told myself, not knowing either Harvey's or Martha's last names. And if he started with the A's early in the morning, he'd probably be up to the H's now. Yeah, that made sense. I found Mr. Green's office. I'm Peter Hatcher, I told his secretary. Go right in, he said. He's expecting you. You wanted to meet me? I said to Mr. Green. I mean, see me? Hello, Peter. Mr. Green looked something like my uncle, but my uncle was clean shaven and Mr. Green had a mustache. Now, now that my father is growing a beard, I'm more aware of these things. We're having a bit of a problem with your brother, Mr. Green said. Oh, so that was it. I should have known. We've tried to get your mother and father on the phone, but there's no answer. So we're hoping you'd be willing to help us. What'd he do this time? I asked. A number of things, Mr. Green said. Come on down to the kindergarten. I'll show you. We walked down the hall together. All the kindergarten babies were busy. Some were building with blocks, others were painting, and a group was playing house in the corner. It was just the way I remembered kindergarten, but I didn't see fudge anywhere. Oh, Mr. Green, Mrs. Hildebrandt said, limping over to us. I'm so glad you're here. I can't do anything with him. He still refuses to come down. I looked up. Fudge was perched on top of the cabinets that were on top of the cubbies. He was stretched out, lying across the top, just inches from the ceiling. Hi, Peta, he called, waving. What are you doing up there? I asked. Resting? Come on, or come on down. No, I don't like this school. I quit. You can't quit, Mr. Green said. Why not? Fudge asked. Because going to school is your job, Mr. Green said. Otherwise, what will you be when you grow up? A bird, Fudge told him. Mr. Green laughed. Creative, isn't he? I wouldn't necessarily call it that, Mrs. Hildebrandt said. Why, he cl why did he climb up there in the first place? I asked. Well, Mrs. Hildebrandt said, that is a long story. Because she's mean, Fudge called. M-E-A-N. Now, Mr. Green, Mrs. Hildebrandt said, you've known me for a long time, and I ask you, have I ever been mean to a child? Knowingly, consciously, intentionally mean, especially on the first day of school. She wouldn't call me Fudge, Fudge said. That's why I had to kick her. He kicked you? I asked Mrs. Hildebrandt. She held up her skirt and showed me her bruised shin. And I don't mind telling you, she said, that I was in great pain. I almost passed out, right in front of the children. Is that when he climbed up on top of the cabinets? I asked. That is correct. Because she wouldn't call me Fudge, Fudge said again. It's not a proper name, Mrs. Hildebrandt said, and it's not as if he, has gotten, he hasn't got a proper name. He has, Farley Drexel Hatcher. I told him that I would call him Farley, or I would call him Drexel, or I would call him FD. But she wouldn't call me Fudge. 
All the little kids turned around, and suddenly the room was very quiet. That's right, Mrs. Hildebrandt said. Fudge is a good name for candy, but it is not a good name for a boy. I told you I'm a bird, Fudge shouted. There is something very definitely wrong with that child, Mrs. Hildebrandt said. There's nothing wrong with him, I said. My mother calls him Fudge. My father calls him Fudge. My grandmother calls him Fudge. His friends call him Fudge. My friends call him Fudge. I call him Fudge. He calls himself Fudge. Yes, we get the picture, Mr. Green said. I can't imagine a parent actually deciding to call a child Fudge, Mrs. Hildebrandt said. You don't know my parents, I told her. Well, that's true, but I think that we ha what we have here is a basic personality conflict, Mr. Green said. So I suggest that we transfer Fudge to Mrs. Ziff's kindergarten. Splendid idea, said Mrs. Hildebrandt. The sooner, the better. You can come down now, I told Fudge. You're going on to the other kindergarten. Will the teacher call me Fudge? He asked. As long as you want her to, Mr. Green said. And will she let me use the round blocks? Mr. Green looked at Mrs. Hildebrandt. I never let them use the round blocks on the first day. It's one of my rules. You can't build anything good without round blocks, Fudge said. We'll ask Mrs. Ziff, Mr. Green told Fudge, but we do have rules here and you will have to obey them. As long as I can use the round blocks, Fudge said. Mr. Green loosened his shirt collar and wiped off his forehead with his handkerchief. Hurry up, I said to Fudge. I'm missing important things upstairs. Like what? Never mind, just get down. Fudge climbed down to the top of the cubies, to the top of the cubbies, and Mr. Green reached up and lifted him the rest of the way down. Goodbye, Farley Drexel, Mrs. Hildebrandt said. Goodbye, rat face, Fudge said to her. I gave him an elbow and whispered, you don't go around calling teachers rat face. Not even if they have one, he asked. Not even then, I said. Mr. Green and I took Fudge next door to Miss Ziff's Miss Ziff's kindergarten. She was reading Arthur the Anteater to the kids. I could tell that Fudge was impressed. I know that story, he said. Arthur doesn't like to eat red ants. Mr. Green handed Miss Ziff Fudge's registration card. His name is Farley Drexel, Mr. Green said, but everyone calls him Fudge. Mrs. Ziff smiled at Fudge, and I'll bet you are as sweet as your name, she said. I am. Fudge agreed, just as Mrs. Hildebrandt. Just ask Mrs. Hildebrandt, I said to myself. My brother's school career had begun. All right, chapter seven, a very cultured bird. Every day, Fudge brought home paintings from his kindergarten class. Mom hung them up on the wall in the kitchen. One night she said, Fudgy, you're doing so well in school. I'm going to get you a special treat. What would you like? A bird, Fudge said, as if he had been thinking about it for years. A bird, Mom repeated. Yes, my very own bird. A bird, Dad said, scratching his new beard. I was thinking more in terms of a yo-yo, Mom said. I have a yo-yo, Fudge told her, but I don't have a bird. I don't see why we can't get Fudge a bird, Dad said. It might be nice for him to have his own pet. But Warren, Mom said, do you really think he's ready for his own pet? Yeah, I do. Well, Mom said, I could see her thinking it over. If it's all right with Daddy, then it's all right with me. And he can sleep in my room, right? Fudge asked. Yes, Dad said. On my bed? No, Dad said. Birds stay in cages, not in beds. But I would be very careful, Fudge said. I would keep him under the covers with me. Birds can't sleep in beds, Mom said. Why not? Fudge asked. Because they like to sleep standing up. They do? Fudge asked. Yes. I think I'll try that tonight, Fudge said. People lie down to go to sleep, Dad explained. Birds stand up. That's just one of the differences between people and birds. Another is that birds can fly, right? Fudge asked. That's right, Dad said. Someday I might be able to fly, just like a bird. Don't count on it, I said. But he wasn't listening. He was dancing around Tootsie's high chair singing, My very own bird, bird, bird. Dada, Tootsie said, tossing her rattle to the floor. That's her latest game. She throws down her toy and then screams until one of us picks it up for her. 
As soon as she has it back, then she throws them down again. Some game. Also, she's teething, so her gums are sore, so she screams a lot. She has this plastic teething ring that we keep in the freezer for her. She likes it. She likes to bite down on it. The cold numbs her gums. The truth is, she'll bite on anything she can. She can get into her mouth, including her toes. I keep telling my mother that it's not a good idea to let Tootsie grow up with her feet and her mouth. But Mom says it's just a phase and that she'll get over it. She even took out the family photo album to show me a picture of myself when I was about Tootsie's age. I had my toes in my mouth, too. I asked my mom to get rid of that picture, along with the one of me naked holding a broom. If that one ever got out, I'd never hear the end of it. Fudge asked Mom if he could bring Tootsie to school for show and tell. He wanted to repeat his lecture on how babies are made for his kindergarten class. Mom phoned Miss Ziff, who thought it was a wonderful idea, but before they went ahead with it, Miss Ziff had to check it out with uh, Mr. Green. Mr. Green said, absolutely not. And so that was the end of that. Fudge was disappointed, but mom and dad convinced him that once he got his bird, he'd have something even more exciting for show and tell. Grandma came to visit for a few days. I'm getting a bird, Fudge told her. What kind of bird are you get? What kind of bird are you going to get? Grandma asked. I don't know. What kind of bird am I going to get? He asked the rest of us. We all spoke at once. A canary, Mom said. A parakeet, Dad said. A mina bird, I said. Fudge looked confused. Grandma said, I see you haven't decided yet. Mina birds can talk, I said. A talking bird? Fudge asked. Yes, you can teach a mina bird to say anything, I added. Anything? Fudge asked. And I could tell what he was thinking. Well, Almost anything, I told him. A talking bird, Fudge said, smiling. Fudgy's going to get a talking bird. Now, wait a minute, Dad said. We haven't decided on what kind of bird we're getting. I was thinking in terms of a nice blue parakeet. You can train a parakeet to fly around the room and land on a stick. And I was thinking in terms of a pretty yellow canary, Mom said. Canaries can sing. They make everyone feel happy. That's nice, Fudge said. Mommy can get a canary, and Daddy can get a parakeet, and Fudgy can get a mina bird. We're only getting one bird, Mom told him. Oh, Fudge said, then I guess Mommy won't get her canary, and Daddy won't get his parakeet, because Fudgy's getting his mina bird. Peter says they can talk, and he knows everything. Mom and Dad looked at me. Well, how was I supposed to know you wanted a canary, I asked Mom. And that you wanted a parakeet, I asked Dad. You never mentioned it before. It should be very educational for Fudgy to have a minor bird, Grandma said. If I teach him to talk, he might teach me to fly, Fudgy said, flapping his arms. Tootsie hiccuped, then started crying. Who wants some home-baked cookies? Grandma asked, as she lifted Tootsie out of her high chair and patted her on the back. Grandma is very good at changing the subject. The next afternoon, when I got home from school, the car was gone and the house was quiet. I went upstairs and was on my way to my room when I heard something funny coming from Tootsie's room. Her door was open, just a crack, and I peeked in. There was Grandma, barefoot, dancing in circles with Tootsie in her arms. She was singing, Toot, toot, Tootsie, goodbye. Toot, toot, Tootsie, don't cry. The choo-choo train that takes me. Kiss me, Tootsie, and then... Hi, Grandma, I said, opening the door all the way. <clears throat> oh, Peter, she stopped and her face turned red. What are you doing? I asked. Dancing, she said. Tootsie likes to dance, you know. No, I didn't know. Tootsie grabbed a handful of Grandma's hair and screeched with delight. What was that song you were singing? I asked. Toot, toot, Tootsie, goodbye, Grandma said. You mean there really is such a song? You weren't making it up? Certainly not. It was very popular back in, let's see. Oh, I can't remember the year, but it was very popular. Tootsie bounced up and down in Grandma's arms, wanting more. Grandma passed her to me. Here, you try it. Me, I said. You want me to dance with Tootsie? Why not? Grandma, I'm in sixth grade. I don't go around dancing with babies in my arms. Why not? Well, because. Come on, Grandma said, I'll sing, you dance. 
and she began her song again. Toot, toot, tootsie, goodbye. Toot, toot, tootsie, don't cry. I twirled around and around with Tootsie in my arms, and Grandma was right. She loved it. She screamed and laughed and threw her head back, and pretty soon I was laughing too. And all three of us were having a fine old time when Fudge appeared at the door and said, What are you doing, Peta? I looked over, and Mom and Dad were standing there too. Oh, I, uh, that is, I was dancing, Grandma said. Tootsie likes to dance. So we were dancing with her. She found her shoes under Tootsie's crib and stepped into them. I put Tootsie down in her infant seat and smoothed my hair with my hands, ready to explain that it was Grandma's idea and I was just going along with her. But it turned out that I didn't need to explain anything because nobody seemed to think it was strange that I was dancing with Tootsie or that Grandma was singing her Toot Toot Tootsie Goodbye song. Guess what, Fudge said. What, Grandma asked. I saw him. I saw my mina bird. Where, I asked. At the pet store, Fudge said. We're going to bring him home tomorrow. They had to order a cage. He's all black with yellow legs and a yellow nose. Yellow Bill, I said. Nose, Bill. Who cares, Fudge said. And he can talk. What does he say? He can say hello in French. In French, I asked. That's right, in French, Mom said. He's very cultured. And I've already named him, Fudge said. What did you name him, Grandma asked. I expected him to say Pierre or Jacques, since he speaks French. Uncle Feathers, Fudge said. Uncle Feathers, I said. Uncle Feathers, Fudge said again. Isn't it a good name for a bird? It's uh, unusual, I said. And interesting, right? Fudge asked. Oh, yes, definitely interesting, I told him. It's a real privilege, Fudge said, isn't it? It's not a privilege, I told him. It has nothing to do with privilege. I should never have used that word with such a little kid. He still didn't know how to use it. He probably never would. So it's not a privilege, Fudge said. So who cares? And he began to sing. Uncle Feather came to town flying in a blue sky, yellow nose and yellow legs, and he belongs to me, oh my. Come on, Grandma, Fudge said. Dance with me now. He and Grandma held hands and danced around the room while Fudge sang his latest to the tune of Yankee Doodle. My family and our musical numbers were getting to be too much, so I took off for Alex's house for some peace and quiet. The next day, Mom and Fudge went down to the pet store and returned with Uncle Feather, complete with cage, cover, and box of food, and a book called Getting to Know Your Mina Bird. Bonjour, bonjour, Uncle Feather said, over and over again. That means hello in French, Fudge told me, as if I didn't already know. Dad carried the cage up to Fudge's room, which happened to be next to my room, and all afternoon, all I heard was bonjour, bonjour, in bird voice. I banged on the wall between my room and Fudge's. Can you teach him how to say something else? I'm trying, I'm trying, Fudge hollered. I'm trying, I'm trying, Uncle Feather repeated. Swell, I thought. <clears throat> we just got Fudge out of the habit of repeating everything I said. And now we're going to have a bird who does the same thing. Why didn't I keep my big mouth shut at the dinner table that night? Why didn't I convince Fudge to listen to mom and get a canary or to dad and get a parakeet? The next morning, when I went to have a look at Uncle Feather, he greeted me with, Bonjour, stupid. Isn't he smart? Fudge asked. Doesn't he learn fast? Yeah, he's terrific, I said. As I left the room, Uncle Feather called out, Goodbye, stupid. Goodbye. Goodbye yourself, I said. Yourself, yourself, he repeated. And he likes to eat worms and insects and plants, Fudge said at breakfast. Oh no, Mom said. He'll be very happy eating the food we bought for him at the pet store. But Mommy, Fudge said, you wouldn't feed Tootsie just one kind of food, would you? That's different, Mom said. Tootsie is a baby. Uncle Feather is a bird. I know that, Fudge said, but Uncle Feather needs worms to be happy. You, wouldn't want him, you would want him to be happy, won't you? I'm sure he can be happy without worms, Mom said, pushing her plate aside. Let's talk about this later, Dad said. It's not the best breakfast conversation. Worms, 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 Fudge sang. That's enough, Fudge, Dad said, but Mom was already in the bathroom and she didn't come back to the table. 
Grandma came to visit the following weekend and was surprised to find that Fudge no longer slept in the hallway outside my parents' bedroom. I have to sleep in my own room now, Fudge told her. Uncle Feather needs me. Of course he does, Grandma said, standing in front of Uncle Feather's cage. And you have a lovely, you are a lovely birdie, aren't you? Lovely birdie, lovely birdie, Uncle Feather said. Grandma laughed. Oh my, and so smart. So smart, so smart. Oh my, so smart, Uncle Feather said. That night, Mom and Dad went out and Grandma stayed with us. We all watched TV together. Tootsie was on Grandma's lap, having her late night bottle. So how's kindergarten going, Grandma asked Fudge. I have a nice teacher, he said. She says I'm as sweet as my name. Well, you are, aren't you? Grandma said. I snorted. Do you think I am? Fudge asked Grandma. I certainly do, Grandma told him. I snorted again. All the time? Fudge asked. Well, maybe not all the time, Grandma said, but most of the time. When they... When, then why do you come here just to play with Tootsie and not me? I come here to see all of you, Grandma said, burping Tootsie. But you're always holding her, Fudge said, and singing dumb songs to her. They're not dumb, I said. They're for when Grandma was a girl. You were a girl, Fudge asked, trying to keep up, trying to get up on Grandma's lap. Certainly, Grandma said, shifting Tootsie into her other arm to make room for Fudge. You were little like me? Yes, Grandma said. And I went to school just like you. Fudge shoved Tootsie out of the way, so Grandma passed her to me. What did you do there? Fudge asked. Oh, I sang songs and painted pictures, played games, learned to read. You learned to read in kindergarten? Maybe it was first grade, Grandma said, patting Fudge's head. It was a long time ago. It's hard for me to remember. You know what, Grandma? Fudge said. No, what? I'm the middle child now, so I need lots of attention. Who told you that? Grandma asked. I heard Mommy talking on the phone. It's more important for you to play games with me than with Tootsie, and you should try to remember that. What about me? I asked. Where do I fit in? You don't need attention, Fudge said. You're in sixth grade. I was beginning to get annoyed. That doesn't mean I don't need attention. Everybody needs attention, Grandma said. Even you? Fudge asked. Yes, even me, Grandma said. Who gives you attention? Fudge asked Grandma. My family and my friends, Grandma said. You should get a bird, Fudge said. A bird would give you lots of attention. A bird wouldn't care if you were the middle child or not. Neither would a dog, I said. You could get a dog like Turtle. As soon as he heard his name, Turtle looked up and barked. Tootsie opened her eyes and said, Ga, ga, go, ga. That's right, I told her. Now go back to sleep. Grandma went upstairs to tuck Fudge into bed, and I went to put Tootsie into her crib. Good night, sleep tight, Grandma said to Fudge. Good night, sleep tight, sleep tight. Good night, Uncle Feather called. Grandma dropped the cover over his cage. It's the only way to shut him up. And even then, he kept on calling, good night, good night, until I kicked the base of his cage. After we'd had Uncle Feather for two weeks, Fudge was ready to bring him to school to show and tell. Miss Ziff invited the other, other kindergarten class to come and see him. I got special permission from Mr. Green to skip half of English to go down to Fudge's room in case of an emergency. Mrs. Hildebrand's kindergarten class marched in and sat in a circle on the floor right behind Fudge's class. Uncle Feather's cage stood in the middle of the circle and everyone was settled. Fudge pulled the cover off the cage and said, presenting Uncle Feather. Ooh, all the little kids said. What a beautiful bird Farley has, Mrs. Hildebrand said. Isn't the bird beautiful class? Yes, Mrs. Hildebrand's class answered, sounding like robots. Yes, what? Mrs. Hildebrandt asked. Yes, Farley has a beautiful bird, her class said together. He speaks French, Fudge said. Does he really? Mrs. Hildebrandt asked. Yes, Fudge told her. Well, what a coincidence, Mrs. Hildebrandt said. So do I. She went right up to Uncle Feather's cage, bent way over and said, Parlez-vous Francais? Uncle Feather cocked his head looked straight at her and said, Bonjour, stupid. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, guys. That is the end of our chapters for tonight. And again, that was chapters 5, 6, and 7 out of Judy Bloom's Super Fudge. And if you guys 
want to continue reading with us. We've got two more nights, Thursday and Friday, and we will finish up the book. So if you guys want to join us back here on the library's Facebook page tomorrow night at 7 p.m., we will read a few more chapters, okay? I hope you guys really enjoyed that this evening. It was so good to see you, and I will see you guys right back here tomorrow night. All right? Okay, guys, have a great evening. Bye.